in the spectrum policy process. I know it's not news to this audience that strategic planning has become a more widely used tool for spectrum policy, both in the US and in other countries. And it's almost become like Moore's Law with a, a lot more spectrum plans and planning efforts and planning groups every 18 months. It's almost exploding in terms of the amount of spectrum strategic planning that's been happening. This panel will focus on the success of these efforts, not just right now, but in the past, and how to improve the process of this strategic planning going forward, both for ongoing and future efforts. We have a panel, as you know, of very widely recognized experts in the spectrum field who have followed this issue for many years, in some cases decades, and have their own vantage point and, and unique views about these issues. They come to us as engineers, consultants, lawyers, policy makers, and industry advocates. I'm going to start with very brief introductions for each of them. Their bios are in your materials, so we're not going to do extensive reading of, of bios here. And each panelist will have five minutes to give their presentation and overview about the strategic planning process. Each will take a slightly different perspective. And we're going to start with Chuck Jackson. He's going to provide an overview and kind of historical piece that he wrote about how the process started and is going uh, forward over time. He's a consulting engineer and a professor at GW, uh, George Washington University. And I'll turn it over to Chuck. OK, thank you, Michelle. Um, I just preface this by saying that uh, Pierre assigned us the topic of the, the promise and problems of strategic plans. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that everything I have to offer on this topic has been, been said by others before, and, and, and they said it better. I'm going to begin by quoting one of those others. It's a, you know, plans are worthless, but planning is everything, is, is a famous aphorism, usually attributed to uh, President Eisenhower. Um, he used it in a speech, but when he used it in a speech, he attributed, uh, he attributed it to um, a statement he'd heard long ago in the Army. And, and he explained uh, the meaning of it by saying, when an emergency arises, your pre-existing plans are usually useless. But if you haven't been planning, you can't start to work, intelligently at least. That is, the reason it is so important to plan, to keep yourselves steeped in the character of the problem that you may one day have to be called on to solve, or to help solve. Um, and I think, I think that staying steeped in the character of the problem is, is one of the greatest benefits of strategic planning, the FCC. Uh, an institution such as the FCC, you know, the statutory uh, mission remains unchanged for years or decades, but uh, priorities change as technologies and markets and the membership of the commission changes. So I think commitment, true commitment to a five or 10 year strategic plan is an unrealizable ideal. But um, again, staying steeped in the process um, or in the problem is worth a lot. Uh, similarly, there's some universals in the FCC process. Uh, one is its organization of day-to-day -day, uh, policy issues under the rulemaking process. Now, the rulemaking process has its, its virtues, but it's not always well suited for, for considering broad policy issues that cross many different uh, uh, technologies or services. Uh, and I think strategic planning provides a mechanism for analyzing such issues in a general context, you know, not uh, tied down by a band plan or the needs of a, of a certain uh, specific industry. And the outputs of the uh, strategic planning are the plans themselves, but it's also very important um, that the understanding and knowledge that the FCC get from that process. Uh, and I just, as an aside, historical aside, I want to note that a lot of our current policies, many of our important current policies, came about because the FCC staff had been thinking hard about uh, problems and new solutions. Um, I think unlicensed is a good example there. And it was the FCC staff, not industry, academia, or public interest um, uh, activists that uh, brought these policies uh, into the debate and ultimately into play. Um, but enough of that. Uh, one concluding thought, uh, the, the psalmist, at least in some translations, had the last word to say on palming, on uh, planning, sorry. The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Uh, Pierre also asked us to um, prognosticate regarding the future regulatory issues, and um, I'll provide my views. Uh, they aren't worth much, and also note that 
Pierre didn't ask me to be polite, so if you're offended, <laughs> it's Pierre's fault. Uh, one, uh, opportunistic spectrum use, like cognitive radio, I think it's overhyped and overpromised. It'll be used, but I think the use and benefits will be relatively modest. I'm not going on a limb here. Various forms of cognitive radio systems, using humans as the cognitive part, have been around for a century, so saying that it's going to continue is not going out on a limb. Um, two, the uh, block of spectrum that was made available in, in legislation earlier this year for unlicensed use up at five gigahertz will generate somewhere between 10 and 100 times more consumer benefits than only unlicensed use of TV white space. Um, three, spectrum efficiency will continue to increase. We know the promise of several technologies like MIMO interference calculation, multi-user detection, but uh, we don't know what else needs to be uh, it comes, has yet to be invented, but there'll probably be a lot. Um, we'll continue to expand the range of frequencies that can be exploited. Now, I could be wrong, but I think the uh, vision of low UHF uh, frequencies as, as beachfront property will come to be seen as a quaint anachronism, one that was promoted in the early 21st century mostly by lawyers, not engineers. Um, and five, uh, five, sort of a pessimistic view, the, the problem of the rising noise floor in, in the exploitable radio spectrum will continue to grow. Uh, regulatory responses will be haphazard and effective. Negative impacts on, on consumers will be significant, but few will notice or complain. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next, we'll hear from Peter Tengula, who many of you know is an attorney and currently serving as senior advisor at NTIA. He's had many high-level posts at the FCC as well including serving as the director of the Spectrum Policy Task Force under Chairman Powell. How did this all get started? Well, I, I, got, I initially thought it traced back to a meeting that we held, um, that was held in the Chairman's office back in March 2001. And you remember, January 2001, Chairman, Commissioner Powell became Chairman Powell. Um, and these two guys from DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency at the Department of Defense came over. Uh, one was Paul Colazzi, the other was who was heading up the program called the XG or Next Generation. And the other one was Tony Tether, who was a contractor for DARPA at the time, but unbeknownst to us, he then became quickly became the uh, head of DARPA. He's got an activist meeting, which was on this concept called dynamic spectrum utilization, that had something to do with the, all the unused spectrum that these guys at DARPA were finding out there. Uh, this dynamic spectrum utilization, these, these guys are very innovative. They're saying this is the end of the need for allocations. Chairman Powell jumped on this opportunity and said, doesn't matter which one, we need to hire these guys, one of these guys. And lo and behold, we, obviously, we got Paul Colazio, and I give him, you know, all this. So I, I like to say that's really when I got started, but you know, it really dates back, you know, way before then. Say, but back to uh, maybe this report from 1966 on the silent crisis, a report on telecommunication science in the federal government. Uh, but you can see my collection of reports. Some people collect <laughs> stamps, <laughs> you know, coins. I collect spectrum policy reports. You know, I got here, some of them in my bag, but this is my favorite. Uh, and if you read, that, read this one from 1966, it does a lot of the same things. I wrote it when I was one years old. <laughs> but when you know Chairman Powell took took the reins, he, he he wanted to lay out kind of his plan for you know running the commission. Um, and he outlined five specific areas um, to, to guide the agenda. One was broadband deployment, competition policy, spectrum policy, and reexamine of uh, foundations of media regulation. And the fifth was homeland security. Um, uh, he said that this was a press conference he did in October 2001. So uh, he said, allocation policy is not keeping pace with relentless spectrum demands. Did we just hear that? Um, uh, it is, it's, it's not effectively moving, poly uh, moving spectrum to its highest and best use in a timely manner. Um, he th said the central problem with cur the current approach, um, I guess we'd say it today, and control scheme that requires government officials to determine the best use for spectrum and to constantly change the allocation table to accommodate new spectrum needs and new services. Um, he identified that there were few incentives for using spectrum 
efficiently um, and outline four principal objectives. Um, and you can go back and look at this, uh, this video or the uh, press release we did uh, around that time. And suggest this commission action. It's one of those commissions act, commission actions you said we're going to do. is to establish a partnership with DARPA. You know, and that was kind of the hint that the following, the following year, 2002, we brought on Paul Klotz from DARPA to run the Director Policy Task Force. Um, he also mentioned using the Technical Advisory Committee as well. So what else was going on back in 2001? Just to put this in context, the Commission had sunsetted the CMR Spectrum cap. There was next wave litigation going on. Uh, 3G AWS, Negotiations, uh, rulemaking are going on. The rulemaking is going on 700 SDR rules, and oh yes, 9/11. So that will kind of put it all in context. Um, so I'm not going to go through all what happened in 2002, but this was the result. And, but I did go back, at least to Chairman Kennard, some of his previous statements and speeches, and it's amazing how many of the same points about market-oriented policies. Uh, and uh, the need for receiver performance issues. Uh, this is a speech he did back in uh, um, 2000, February 2000, CTAA. Um, I'll, I know I'm out of time, and I'll just point out that uh, this stuff is still going on, and um, looking forward to talking about what kind of lessons yes. learned from this particular strategic plan. I hope there are questions from the audience about what actually happened at the time. Um, I can't take that. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Marcus is our next speaker. He has been a consulting engineer and advisor to many on a range of technical issues. He's also a former professor and a former high-ranking policymaker at the FCC. Mike? Thank you very much. Um, the first month or two I was at FCC, I got bored and I went down to the library and asked the question, what happened when the FCC started in 1935? I went to look up before there was FCC record. What you know? Where are the minutes of the first FCC meeting? And it was fascinating to me because does anyone, does anyone know the answer? First FCC meeting. First FCC meeting was trick questions in 1935. I guess it took a while to get people confirmed. The F very first action the FCC did was to set up three divisions, meaning basically subcommittees. But then at that time there were seven commissioners for seven-year terms. Um, until the Reagan administration, there were seven commissioners, seven year terms. And the seven commissioners divided themselves up into three parallel subcommittees one for radio, one for telephone, one for telegraph, because telegraph was a big thing in 1935. And so there were three mini FCCs. Now, as weird as it seems, FCC was descended in part from the Interstate Commerce Commission, and that's how the ICC had always done things. Also in 1935, there was no Municipal Procedures Act. In 1935, industry was much simpler. Technological choices were much fewer, and the upper usable spectrum was probably around 100 megahertz at that time. We live in a much more complicated world today, but we have an APA which came in after World War II, was perhaps as a reaction to the New Deal, that makes decision making much, much more complicated, it results in courts, appeals, and everything. We have five commissioners for five year terms, so the average tenure of commissioners is a lot, lot less than it used to be in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I frankly believe, as I said in my written paper, this commission does not want to have a, have a strategy. It, the telecom policy program at the University of Colorado, the Dale founded and ran, had a wonderful textbook that's now basically out of print that you can find used copies around. And there's an article in there on models of decision making at FCC. And it talks about FCC having several models of decision making for different topics. I suspect part of the problem is that the model which is appropriate for broadcast ownership and content is used too much for spectrum policy making. And when you do broadcast ownership and content, you don't really want to have a strategy or a long range plan. You act more like a court with ad hoc decision making. And FCC has tried over the years to come up with a variety of policy statements. They've all lasted a year or two and then they disappear. Other major countries have ongoing spectrum policy statements that they revise from time to time. I'm talking about the UK, Canada, Japan, and Australia. Have ongoing, whether these are the best policies in the world, everybody knows what they are. They are revised. They are brought up to date. 
as the leadership changes, as technology changes, the FCC spasmodically comes up with a policy statement and then forgets about it within a year or two. Uh, the problem is technology does not move all by itself. Technology comes from people having ideas, merging with investment capital that turns these ideas into prototypes that make sense and needs more investment capital and practical use. Qualcomm was able to get its key approval for its new technology in two years after it was incorporated in 1985. That type of decisive decision making plus signals of transparency to the investment community where they expect to transfer telecom policy but frankly lacking not all, not under this commission I don't want to criticize this commission for being unusual but basically for the past two decades FCC doesn't have the attention span to come up with any policy and stick with it and that's having a bad effect on the investment community uh, you know was the spectrum policy task force policy the best one in the world maybe it was maybe it wasn't but some policy that's put in place and has maintained and updated, sends signals to investment communities of, of, of transparency and that investments in new communication technology are not absolutely certain, but are a lot more predictable than in the past. So I think of that, I would stop. Thank you, Mike. Next, we'll hear from Kathleen Hand, who is the Vice President of the Federal Regulatory Affairs at T-Mobile and the former senior FCC policymaker, including serving as Deputy Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Kathleen? Thank you, thank you, Michelle. And I also was on the Spectrum Policy Task Force with uh, Peter many years ago. So, um, Well, I just thought I'd start out talking a little bit from, as the carrier on the panel about the, the Spectrum Crunch. And uh, the title of my paper was really sort of uh, rubber meets the road, effectively. So I think uh, policy planning and strategic plans are great, but if you're out there and you're a carrier trying to serve consumers and customers, uh, in the end of the day, uh, you need results. And so I think uh, all the good planning aside, I think uh, the spectrum crunch is very real. And I wanted to cite just a couple of statistics, because it's really an amazing paper. Cisco did a paper on, uh, it's entitled Global Mobile uh, data traffic forecast for 2011. It's a white, uh, 2011 to 2016, it's a white paper. And some of the statistics in here are just amazing, so I wanted to, to cite a few of them just to put things in perspective here. So they predict that global mobile data traffic will increase 18-fold between 2011 and 2016. Okay, what does that translate into? 78% growth and reaching, and I don't even know what this is, but 10.8 exabytes per month, whatever an exabyte is, by 2016. By the end of 2012, the number of mobile connected devices will exceed the number of people on Earth. Okay, which is great, I think, if you're a carrier. Uh, so the, the mobile network connection speeds will increase ninefold by 2016. And two-thirds of the world's mobile data will be video by 2016. Okay. So it's very real. It's happening. And uh, Spectrum is really the lifeblood. Uh, it's the air the carriers breathe uh, on behalf of our customers. So it's a very important resource. And it's uniquely managed uh, in the US by the, by the government. I've been involved in Spectrum policy for odd years now, and I think that um, there have been some high points uh, that I'm just going to touch upon, and some of them uh, are in my, in my paper, but uh, I do think at some point we're at, we have to sort of get to that, that point of uh, actually deploying additional spectrum in the market, and I think some of that is happening uh, as we speak um, in, in some of the ways that I think uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel cited earlier. But I think some of the high points, I mean, I, I view sort of uh, modern uh, wireless industry policy really coming out of the Spectrum Auction uh, Authority that was granted in 1993. That was really a very revolutionary change in how we allocate and assign the Spectrum. And it's good things have come from it. Uh, T-Mobile came from it. So I, I, think, <laughs> I think it was uh, very positive for competition and very positive for consumers. Uh, the Spectrum Policy Task Force that, that, uh, 
the Peter reference, a lot of good things, hopefully more than just a, a binder of paper, but some good things came out of that Spectrum Policy Task Force that actually, uh, in the end of the day, uh, are being implemented even now. Uh, things around white spaces and so forth that were recommended in the Spectrum Policy Task Force. The National Broadband Plan is a great framework uh, calling for 500 megahertz of spectrum uh, and then a lot of follow-on work that's happening with NTIA there. T-Mobile uh, is very active on the federal spectrum uh, end of that. Uh, in terms of sharing the federal spectrum, we think that that's something that we want to explore, we want to test. Uh, it's a great concept, uh, but we actually, you know, it's sort of rubber meets the road. Uh, uh, theory, I think we're getting a little bit of voice back here. Uh, I think that we really want to see, uh, should I stop for a Yeah. I'm not sure who's controlling me. I'm not sure who's controlling me. Okay. Yeah, okay. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Okay. It's like you know, when you listen to a phone call and hear yourself speak, how disruptive that is. So anyhow, sorry about that. But I think, uh, so there's a lot of good work happening with NTIA uh, on that. So we very active in pushing some of those sharing concepts and we'll be, we'll be uh, along with Verizon and, and others, we're going to be very active on that. Um, there were some good, good ideas along those lines in the PCAST report, again, uh, I just come from this from the perspective of sort of just practicality, you know, when you have an ongoing business and customers and so forth. Some of these are great ideas uh, and they should be explored. But in the meantime, we need to run our businesses, we need to support our customers, we need to make sure they have the spectrum resources and the network capabilities and the enhancement capabilities that, that uh, serve them well. So, um, looking forward to the incentive auctions, we see that as a a big opportunity. The one thing that worries me about it is the complexity. Uh, you know, and and let's be frank, that auction, those auctions are only going to be successful if many broadcasters show up to uh, to participate. And so, uh, really, really hope that as as uh, an industry, we can uh, be reaching out to those broadcasters who are interested to try to uh, make them comfortable with the process and ensure that there is uh, good participation in that, uh, in that auction. So just in conclusion, I think, uh, again, we got, uh, come from the perspective of T-Mobile, a, a carrier that's been very, I think, uh, progressive on spectrum policy, very active on spectrum policy. Spectrum is the lifeblood of our industry. It's important to competition. It's important to consumers. Uh, good to have strategic plans looking forward, but we also need to think about the here and now and uh, the companies that are trying to, to provide service now and making sure that there are sound spectrum policies supporting competition and supporting uh, those services now. Thanks, Kathleen. And finally, we'll hear from Ellen Goodman, who is a law professor at Rutgers University at Information Policy Law. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so in academia, um, some, some people call strategic plans self-study. Um, and in a way, this is a cop-out, because if you call something a study, it means you don't have to be accountable um, uh, for the, the goals. Um, but in another way, I think um, the term self-study points to an underappreciated value of the planning process, um, which is that it can serve as uh, sort of an institutional audit. Uh, it can help uh, to socialize new concepts that are not ready for implementation. And I think the Spectrum Policy Task Force report performs some of these functions. I'll, I'd be curious to hear from Peter and from Paul Kaladze, who I think is here, um, what effect the, the process of creating the report had on the agency, agency staff. Um, but I can say from the outside that you know, the, the strong endorsement of um, spectrum flexibility, the more tentative endorsement of the interference temperature um, were, uh, I think, were really important for the field. Um, Ten years ago when that report came out, I didn't notice what was missing from it. Um, and this is a strategic plan for the public interest. Now, one of the reasons I may not have noticed it was because I was an industry lawyer. 
Um, it wasn't my job to look for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think another reason is that that's just not where real public interest concerns were thought to lie, not the spectrum. They were in broadcasting, cable, um, wired broadband. Uh, but now we know that spectrum is the whole ball of wax. Um, any value that we have in, in telecom policy um, is going to be found also in, uh, in spectrum. Um, so what do I mean by public interest values? Of course, spectrum efficiency is one of those public interest values. Um, so, so some of what we call public interest values fit well in a model that focus on, focuses almost entirely on market efficiency and getting spectrum into the hands of um, carriers and other service providers. Um, in order to have efficient spectrum markets, we will want competition. So competition is both a public interest value <coughs> and a market value. But other public interest values are distinct from the market discourse. And communications policy has always had space um, for those values. So uh, we have talked about universal access, affordable and free service, reliability and safety, um, user empowerment, privacy. These are all terms that have in one way or another um, made an appearance in telecom policy. Uh, and I think you know what we might call the broadcast era, there were relatively clear narratives about the value, the democratic value, of um, access and distributed communicative capacity. I don't think the same thing can be said um, for the, these values uh, in spectrum policy. Um, and I think that's a problem. So, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, what really got me thinking about this was looking at the pending broadcast incentive auction. So here you have a situation where spectrum is being taken out of a band, um, maybe, right, if broadcasters um, show up at the auction, uh, that is regulated in the public interest, and it's being auctioned for wireless, and I think most of us can agree that's a good thing, and it ought to happen, um, and for sure no one is advocating anything like broadcast regulation in the wireless space, but the basic concerns with access, entry, distributed power, and reliability, and some other um, things have not changed. Those are still going to be with us. Earlier this year, Congress passed the Spectrum Act um, authorizing these auctions. And public interest groups led by public knowledge, thank you, Harold Feld, um, did fabulous work in fighting for unlicensed spectrum in this, in this band. And they beat back a House provision that would have um, uh, shut unlicensed operations out of the reallocated band. Um, and I think if you look at that battle, you'll see that the arguments for unlicensed spectrum do deploy some of the traditional public interest language. Uh, what's good about unlicensed spectrum is that it supports access, portable service, innovation without permission, disrupt disruptive technologies, distributed control. So those are all familiar sort of public interest tropes. Um, for understandable reasons, unlicensed advocates uh, in that battle, um, and typically, um, sort of use a market-based language in which they are competing with licensed spectrum, licensees or licensed spectrum hopefuls over which approach fosters more economic value, more innovation. Um, and I think this market-based vocabulary has its limits. Everyone's for innovation. Um, but the narrative, this narrative of innovation, doesn't necessarily sound in the kinds of justice themes that have mobilized policy passions in the past. Um, and so this brings me to two criticisms of the public interest discourse in the spectrum, at least as we see it played out in the TV band. Um, the first is just that the public is not sufficiently engaged. Uh, if you think back um, earlier this year to the SOPA and HIPAA dramas, um, what you saw was this groundswell of public opposition to legislation that might have blocked uh, access to certain internet sites and services. And it's easier to see um, the public interest when you're talking about the content layer. It's just, it's less wonky. It's easier for people to get their, um, their heads and their hands around. Uh, and so in that case, the copyright issue was translated into something that people could connect with freedom and democracy. Um, and spectrum issues aren't like that, but I think they should be, and I think they could be. The second um, criticism I have is that the portfolio of public interventions um, that are considered, I think, is just too small. So, uh, and I know, you know, Chuck mentioned this, there's, there's some controversy even among unlicensed advocates um, as to whether unlicensed operation in the TV band is going to be productive. Um, 
and in any case, the legislation imposes pretty severe limits on how much of the spectrum can be used for unlicensed. So I think we ought to think, and it'd be good to kind of put this into a strategic planning process, um, what, uh, what are the other, first of all, um, and this has been studied, what are the other bans that might be better for unlicensed, where should the public interest energies lie, but also what's the role of interoperability and standards. Um, uh, forgive me for the analogy, but in property law, um, there are not just public parks, there are easements and setbacks and building codes and zoning. There are lots of tools that you use to achieve public interest goals. Um, in spectrum, should we have a sort of a comprehensive analysis of um, where license conditions are appropriate of the kind that the FCC tried in the 700 megahertz ban? Um, we're entering, I'm almost done, um, we're entering the world of the Internet of Things when Spectrum, especially unlicensed, is going to be is being used to connect things to each other and to people. Um, does that change the analysis when we're not really talking about personal communications? What are the social implications? What does communications policy have to say about it? Um, and so finally, I would just close by saying, um, you know, Spectrum policy is wonky and it's conducted by very few, and probably most of them are in this room. Um, and at one time, broadcast policy was the same way. Uh, and I think whatever you think of how broadcast policy was executed, it was a good thing that it came to be kind of um, uh, socialized publicly as something that was important um, for democracy. Uh, and I think the same thing needs to happen in Spectrum. Thank you very much, Ellen. It won't surprise you to hear that the panelists today were very eager to respond to each other's papers and uh -huh. have a few minutes left to do that. So. I'll just open it up to the panelists before opening up to the floor for comments and questions. Uh, Mike, do you want to start or others? Uh, Peter? Chuck? Well, I'll just respond to something that, that, that Ellen said about, about public interest engagement. And it seems to me, we correspond a little bit on this, and it seems to me one thing I, I see lacking in, in that community is, is uh, sort of a an in-depth technical analysis capability, and they take their technical analysis from people they like to listen to, rather than being able to do much of it in-house. And I think that Sorry. limits their understanding. As one who was personally responsible for getting a huge amount of spectrum into the unlicensed category, people expect me to be the unlicensed greatest cheerleader, and I'm very enthusiastic about unlicensed, but where I disagree slightly with Ellen is the issue is not unlicensed because FCC in the 80s tried several approaches on license and where the ISM band, what became Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, was phenomenally successful beyond our fondest dreams. Unlicensed PCS and UNII were dismal failures in the near term. Unlicensed PCS was a permanent dis dismal failure. UNII got better when they changed the rules. And the problem was that UPCS and UNAI were unlicensed but had very, very detailed technical rules, whereas the ISM ban had virtually no technical rules. And, and when I would like to say that in 1985, I envisioned Wi-Fi and Bluetooth again. But we wrote, we had faith in deregulation, we had faith in creativity, and we wrote rules broad enough that when the idea came, not only was the spectrum there, the technical flexibility was there, whereas the people who wrote the rules for UPCS and UNAI, consulting with industry, industry wanted those things. Industry did not want the ISM band, by the way, they hated the idea. Uh, they, industry invoked in the FCC rules, very, very detailed rules, and as the world evolved, those rules are out of touch with the reality. So the, the key thing is not just unlicensed spectrum, it's unlicensed spectrum with technical flexibility. And I think the reason why we saw this great success in Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and a variety of other things in those bands <coughs> is the technical flexibility so that unlicensed by itself, if you put too many technical regulations on unlicensed, you may doom it to unlicensed PCS state. Well, I, one, one comment I would have is sort of goes to some of the things that Peter said um, but it's just, I think, you know, we're sort of on this knee curve of innovation right now. And uh, it's, I think the challenge for government is just, you know, when, when Peter pulls out a report from 1966 and then another one from, you know, I think 
And, and some of the same things were said in 1966 that are said in 2012. That doesn't make me particularly feel good, actually. Uh, it just, you know, it, it takes too long, you know, for some of these policies to actually come to be. And I don't know what the answer is to it, but I just think the marketplace, the innovation that's happened in the market shouldn't be held back. Uh, uh, policies just can't seem to get ahead of it. And, uh, so I think, you know, maybe a little more leaving it to the marketplace uh, is in order uh, to make that happen. But, uh, so. well, let me give you an example of where the lack of plans is more than that. Allocations now go to 275 gigahertz. Great. Farther than anyone could possibly build with a commercial one. At the Beijing Olympics, there was an operational 120 gigahertz system. That is illegal in the United States. If I tried to sell one tomorrow, I would have to go into Julie and I would have to file a petition for rulemaking for service rules. There are no service rules above 95 gigahertz. There are absolutely no guidance from FCC of what they would do for service rules between 95 and 275 gigahertz. And while one would not expect large opposition, if I was a VC trying to decide what to fund, there are huge uncertainties. This is a big, you know. There is no, not even the slightest hint of you, what U.S. spectrum policy would be for service rules above 95 gigahertz. And that vacuum discourages investment, it discourages capital formation, and discourages American innovation. The Japanese people who built that 120 gigahertz system for the Beijing Olympics had guidance from their government. The U.S. high-tech industry does not have guidance. And I, and I frankly think that part of the issue is that the FCC as it's been run for the past 20 or 30 years, it's just isn't interested in long-term things. It's interested in adjudicating things that come in its door. Uh, occasionally, we see spectrum policies, but you know, like when Michael Powell <coughs> left, I think the spectrum policy task force report was doomed to the trash can. And what I would like to see is maybe something less specific, but which, which is maintained as both technology changes and, and uh, leadership with FCC changes, but at least you see the outline of spectrum policy on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, what Chuck said about engineers in the public interest groups, it would be great if someone wanted to endow these groups to hire, you know, more engineers. And I, I remember being, it might even have been in Boulder, um, five years ago when people were talking about, you know, what should the FCC look like? And a couple people said they should have more engineers. They should have more engineers on the eighth floor, fewer lawyers. And I wonder if that were true, Michael, do you think that the FCC would, I mean, what you're talking about is the FCC should take initiative to do the rulemaking or the service rules and not wait for a petition, um, not just act responsibly to petitions? Is that what you're saying? Do you think engineers would change that, the big population of engineers? I don't think it's less, you know, sometimes you have to do initiatives. We did what became Wi-Fi Bluetooth, we did on our own. What became 60 gigahertz, <coughs> we did on our own. But the, the key thing is sending a signal out there, it doesn't have to be a rulemaking, you know, there is no spectrum policy statement in the U.S. except the spectrum policy task force, but everybody knows that doesn't, that's no longer relevant. It, it's a, a, applicable to the, to the questions here. If, you know, imagine yourself sitting in Silicon Valley with a pile of money, and someone comes to the door and they want to use it for some 120 gigahertz spectrum thing, but the next guy comes to the door and wants to use it for a new computer display. I think you'd give it to the computer display guy, because the computer display guy doesn't have to deal with FCC and get involved in a multi-year rulemaking. And I'm afraid the US wireless technology base, not the carriers, because carriers could buy from anyone in the world, but the technology base is sliding downhill because of this lack of credible U.S. policy doesn't tell them where to invest. And, and whether you like M to Z or don't like M to Z, that should not have taken four and a half years to resolve. You know, they should have perhaps made, they should have had a signal in advance, but even if they didn't have a signal in advance, it should not have taken four and a half years to resolve that. The technical issues and the non-technical issues were not so complex. AT, the FCC dealt with the AT&T T-Mobile merger in one year. They dealt with the NBC Comcast merger in one year. I don't think that the M to Z issue, AWS 3, was any more complex. I'm sure it didn't generate more thousands of pages of comments. 
within NBC, Comcast, or at at and T-Mobile. FCC has to encourage investment by, by being transparent and resolving things in a, time, in a reasonable schedule. Uh, Chuck, I think yeah. I want to hear from uh, Just you one, one response to that observation by Mike. You know, the, the FCC is a political institution with various kinds of accountability. And, and one way to say no very politely is to say, we're studying that issue, we'll get back to <laughs> it. And so if they take four and a half years to resolve an issue, maybe that should have been a hint to MTZ that they should have pulled the plug three and a half years early. Yeah. Um, let me just uh, pick up some of everybody's points. Uh, since everybody's piling on Alan, let me uh, pile on, on that as well and show you one of my Another plan. Uh, another <laughs> plan. Prospects for U.S. Spectrum Management by Covington and Berlin. June 2002, they beat us by few months, right? I don't see public interest mentioned here. Right? I told you, I was right. 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 But, but, I think, but her, her paper does raise an interesting point in the sense that um, you typically think about spectrum policy as being very um, uh, nonpartisan, you know, until very recently. And I think it's been because of these uh, organizations taking various sides. And I hope we can maybe dispose of that, you know, on board, because this is, you know, it's, I think it's been, we got, you know, statements when the Spectrum Policy Task Force, you know, issued its first public notice back in um, June of 2002. It was very bipartisan. We got it, we have a separate statement from Commissioner Thompson and Commissioner Martin, you know, opposing this, this effort. So, um, uh, and that's typically the way it is, but I think that, between the, reading between the lines of some of Ellen's things is that, you know, maybe <coughs> if there can be that, you know, cohesiveness among, you know, um, various folks on, on, because I think the answer on the unlicensed or um, exclusive use, the answer is yes. And a lot of things in between, too. So a lot of experimentation going on. Uh, in response to Chuck's papers and, and all his predictions, I predict that some will happen and some will not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to preface mine by saying, look, Ted Williams only right. had 400, and I'm not as good as he is. So, right. You know. right. Uh, uh, what, yeah. Predictions are hard, especially when it comes to the future. Uh, <laughs> Yogi Berra. Ted Williams, Yogi Berra, come on. The, um, on Mike about decision making at the FCC, um, being on the eighth floor, you know, the bruises that you get from that, I mean, it's not just in spectrum. I mean, it's in everything, right? Um, so it's, that's an institutional issue that, you know, maybe doesn't, you know, necessarily revolve around spectrum, but, you know, generally about the, about the commission and their ability to make uh, decisions. And, and, regard, and with regard to the kind of the shelf life of these kinds of strategic plans, what they call them, a policy statement, a task force report, or whatever the case would be, they obviously they, they do have a short shelf life, and they they tend to be about the same as the, the chairman in charge. But there's a reason for, there's a reason for these, and I think they're sort of a very good reason, and it would be good for you know, policy leaders to do this, you know, like their first year. Because it provides the community with some guidance of kind of what their priorities are, and what their priorities aren't. Um, like I said, we had you know, Chairman Powell people with five five priorities. You know, guess what? Spectrum policy was always really number five. And then when the report came out, you know, we briefed <coughs> on it. He was really excited about it. I had this cheer. We're number three. We're number three. <laughs> we can never, you know, obviously go ahead broadband and homeland security, but. At least you know it got um, it got the top five most most of the time, but really most of the real work is done ad hoc, right? Band by band, service by service, and that has continuity. When Commissioner Powell became Chairman Powell, he inherited a lot of really good stuff that Bill Carr and Dale Hatfield had started, and him as a commissioner, software defined radios, ultra wideband, 3G. All of that stuff started secondary markets, removal of the spectrum gap. All of that started in the 1999-2000 timeframe. You know, and, and another thing Bill Kennard outlined in that speech in, in I think 2000 was um, this concept called two-sided auctions, which I've been working on. And it said this is what we should do to help clear the broadcasters out of channel to 60-69. <coughs> Great idea. It was in the spectrum policy task force report too. 
10 years later, hey, it's implemented into law. That's great. It does have, you know, it does keep on going if you stick with it. Um, and uh, so, uh, but I think policy leaders generally dislike ad hocery being reactive, right? TM, by the way, ad hoc I trademark that. <laughs> but, but you have to have both. And the ad, the ad hoc's band by band, service by service approach, if guided by real principles, you know, some kind of policy statement like this, at least during the term of that leadership, you know, it makes sense. The new, new, new administration comes in, new chairman comes in, things may change. Priorities are, are going to shift, you know that. But at least you know during that time where the priorities are, what the ideas are. And some of those ideas have life and will continue on. Um, I can name a whole list of those. TV uh, White Space is one example. Um, so, uh, who else did I pick on? Uh, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> right. Um, Thank you for your service on the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> and same with Mike. And Mike, too. And everybody else who's involved. I think the most important page on this, this whole task force is the first page that lists all the participants. And the best thing about it was it was interdisciplinary. And that's the, that's the way to solve problems. You identify the problems and you have an interdisciplinary group across all, all, uh, all the uh, organizations involved. That's all. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Let me try to distill just a little tighter exactly what specific lessons might have been learned from some of these strategic plans. So if a group takes off next year, coming up with the next and greatest uh, strategic plan for spectrum policy, what, sh what should they take away from these past efforts? Are there specific <laughs> lessons, that, or even one each, that you'd like to say to you? Ellen, or Dr. let's start with, with something which you for example, talk about the public interest goals more, or is there another takeaway that you would suggest? Well, yeah, you know, I think that. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Uh, I, I was going to say, Something? yeah, no, I think a good strategic plan also has to have a work plan that follows up. Yeah. Uh, you know, it really does have to, it's great to kind of set these, these great ideas out there, but then there, there really does need to be some follow-up I do think spectrum policy tends to be bipartisan in, in there are areas where, where we disagree uh, politically, but I think uh, there's a lot of common thinking, a lot of commonality really drive and, and should drive over, you know, through administration, from administration to administration, or FCC chairman, or NTIA, NTIA, and, and to provide some continuity and certainty for, uh, the industry, I think, is important to do that. So uh, those are two things I, I think, just sort of providing that sort of concrete work plan, okay, what's the follow-up? And then some, uh, some follow-through, even in subsequent administrations, even if it's to say, you know, I didn't agree with that last chairman, I want to do something else. But sometimes, you know, these, these reports do gather dust on a, on a shelf and What's the follow-up that's what I would say is really I agree wholeheartedly. She stole my answer on that <laughs> implementation. <laughs> because that was I, I that was my role as you know, when we got done with this is to implement it. And that was that was very difficult. And I think that it would have been helpful because we had a little concern about some of the commissioners early on. I think it would have been helpful to go out with a policy statement. Get, you know, a imprimatur. It may have had may have a lot of it may have lasted longer. But what we did in, instead is when we started proceedings, rulemakings, you know, notice of inquiry, stuff like that, right off the bat, you know, in November 2002 is when the report came out. December 2002 is when receiver, you know, the, the, the white spaces, I think, really got kicked off. Um, some other things about rural areas, things like that. And, and so um, that's the key to just, I mean, also to have a plan, but just get it going right away uh, as well. Um, another key lesson learned, I think, and, and which was a benefit, was transparency and involvement. Um, the, you know, we had 
several rounds of comments, or at least two rounds of comments, a bunch of open workshops. Um, and uh, so we had, you know, nobody could play the process card. I wasn't involved. I didn't have a voice. You know, so uh, it was uh, all, very well balanced, which I think you did one of those workshops, too. Um, and then, you know, so, and also it'd be problem oriented. You know, I think we learned to, to focus first on identifying what that problem is. Um, and, you know, and that problem was spectrum access, not spectrum scarcity. Um, and we, we, will, we were able to focus on those problems and what the problem and the cause is. That's, that's another lesson learned. Um, and um, obviously, the way you learn lessons is from uh, your mistakes. And I will take the blame for all those mistakes, but I'm not going to admit what they are. Uh, right. I think the most important thing is that you plan. You not only need to plan, you have to have a process for updating it. Because what's, what's happened is that plans come up, they last one year, two years, and then there's a big gap. I think it's important for the wire, for wireless industry, it's a high-tech industry, it needs continuing investment in R&D. And if you don't send the signals of whatever the current plan is, it just stifles, you know. I mean, I disagree strongly with what Chuck, Chuck said there. A government worthy of its people does not spread people along for four years and then say, you should have got the message. For corporate mergers, Wall Street insisted the FCC resolve them in one year. The FCC has a policy statement. We will resolve corporate mergers. It says six months, but it's sort of a rubber band, time span. It really translates to one year, right? T-Mobile was one year, right? It's, it's, it, it's not, okay, it says six months, but it's a rubber <laughs> band, saying, so. But the, <laughs> but the problem, <laughs> consistent, <laughs> consistently, FCC resolves corporate mergers in one year, even though the statement says six months. But the, there should be an ongoing policy statement, and as personnel change, as policies change, as administration <laughs> change, and technology changes, like in the other major countries, that policy statements to evolve, but that's part of transparency. And the U.S. government pushes all our trading partners to have transparency regulation. You know, what's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We should have the same type of transparency and spectrum policy that we urge upon our trading partners. Okay, Chuck, any thoughts on less important? Well, I, I mean, I hear what Mike is saying about about the commission and how it should, you know, be a philosopher king and all that, but. I think you have to you have to look at the incentives of uh, American institutions, the structure of our government, and many of the nations he talks about have parliamentary systems where, in some sense, the spectrum plan is, is made by, um, by the minister or the ruling party. I did some spectrum consulting in New Zealand, and that was a real education in how different institutions matters. New Zealand has a parliamentary system with a uni unicameral legislature, which which means. If the party in power decides they want to do something, it's going to be done. You know, it's, there's no debate. It just the, the, the vote is, and if you don't vote along with any other the party, so unless it's a, a confidence vote, it's going to be whatever the uh, the minister decides. And that's a really different world we have in the United States, where you know you've got independent power and, uh, and House and Senate Commerce Committee, and the commissioners are different in different parties. And so I think hoping for that kind of, of behavior in the American institution. Maybe reaching a little far. One's a sort of adjudicatory process, and the other is a rulemaking, right? I mean, so maybe what you're saying well, is the, more, more spectrum. They, they each generate 20,000 pages of comments, and FCC can deal with those 20,000 pages of comments and make an answer. You know? That, My that's, point that's you all master the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> they need some help there. <laughs> let, let me move on to, to adding one thought of my own in terms of lessons learned. Having worked at both NTIA and the FCC, it seems to me that there ought to be a way to reconcile the two very disparate roles of the two agencies. And that's been hard to do because they each have their own strategic planning process. They work together well, but it's become more difficult as each grapples with their own spectrum needs of their own constituencies. So certainly, if I were to take a lesson away from past efforts, I would try really to bond the two and come up with some joint activities and efforts to try to help them work together, to try to really wrestle with some of those types of uh, spectrum crunch issues that are becoming even more critical every day. Let me open it up with that to the audience for questions, and I'll keep asking my guests. Uh, uh, Jim Snyder from ISO and the NJ Science Center. My question is to the two people on the panel that 
consciousness relations and academic relations. And uh, this one, okay. Uh, many major medical schools they require their faculty to disclose any kind of interest they have in some form sort of surprise when they're things like this or when they're writing. This is clearly not part of the culture of Calvin faculty. I think I've ever heard a telecom faculty that acknowledge either in their written or in their oral presentations by any conference of interest. For Chuck, for example, you are well known to have a whole string of financial interests and ties over time. I don't know currently do. But could you just articulate briefly what are your major consulting relationships? Uh, <coughs> yeah, actually, I haven't been consulting much in this space for the last uh, couple of years, but I've, uh, I've consulted for uh, a variety of firms in the industry, broadcast stations, uh, cable companies, wireless uh, wireless service providers, CTIA. I'd say in the last decade, uh, my clients have tended to be uh, wireless, wireless service providers such as uh, Verizon uh, Wireless, uh, CTIA, um, and some manufacturers. Okay. So I think it's relevant when you talk about unlicensed spectrum, the TV bands for the audience and the press and whatnot to have that context. So Ellen, I have a slightly different question. Does Rutgers Why, you don't want to know about my I'm more interested in Rutgers uh, Law School. What policies do they have for faculty? And in particular, do they have any penalties, if any, when faculty get out there and don't disclose uh, relationships? Uh, so, you know, what what are what are the policies to your to your Not that I know of. Yeah. Okay. All right. Other questions? And we're going to use the mic up front, so please come up or signal, wave your hand. Wait. Yes, Jamal Watkins, Chief of Staff at the Center for Social Inclusion. The question I have is centered around the issue of public interest. I hear this notion of transparency thrown around that, oh, well, there's comments made and the FCC can respond to them, but, you know, under the now second term administration, this notion of Transparency actually includes collaboration as well as participation, not just individuals making comments. And so the question I have around the, the policy creation as it relates to community benefits and community scale, either things being community-led, community-based, and owned, is where has the policy developments over the last 20 years either succeeded and or failed at really being transparent and accountable in terms of collaborating with communities that are traditionally not served, i.e. rural communities or underserved urban communities. Today, but but and, and I don't want to talk about the current 
disputes, but if you go back, the, the FCC staff was considering this issue for what, about 78, 79 to 85 before you adopted the rules? And, and at that time, they were opposed by industry, and the public interest community was nowhere to be seen. Now, the public industry, industry, public interest community supports it after it's already a complete success. But, uh, but there was a situation where I would argue that unlicensed has delivered great value to, to people with uh, limited income, some people in rural areas, more, more in urban areas. But, but I don't see how they could have engaged very well in that, in that debate. And it would have been good if, you know, I think that maybe the organized public interest groups could have at that time, but it wasn't the kind of thing they were interested in. And when you have an issue like that, it's sort of abstract, of enormous benefit in a decade or two, how would you get, and this isn't just one particular, it's anybody in the lay community, how do you get them involved and how do you get a reasonable participation? Well, I think it's gotten easier now. so much question. Matt Larson with uh, Whisper with the Wireless Internet Service Provider Association. You get a message from rural America. Uh, I run a uh, fixed wireless operation that uses unlicensed spectrum in uh, rural areas of uh, western Nebraska, eastern Wyoming, Colorado, and uh, northeast Colorado. Uh, there's two, three thousand other operators like me around the U.S. delivering service to you know, somewhere between two and three million subscribers that uh, you know, we're providing an alternative to DSL cable and uh, wire and mobile uh, wireless. So I think it's a great illustration of the use and utility of unlicensed spectrum. And uh, a couple of things I'd be interested to hear you guys talk about. One of them, you know, talking about uh, Chuck was talking about engaging, and you know, really the mobile carriers should be engaged with more uh, unlicensed spectrum, more that more in state than anybody else, simply because. At this point, smartphones are running about 50% of total traffic over uh, unlicensed spectrum through Wi-Fi. Uh, tablets is around 95%. Uh, that represents somewhere around a 40 to 50 billion dollar investment in cell sites if you're going to build out cell sites to deliver that. So, cell phone companies, mobile mobile providers are actually getting a huge benefit from unlicensed spectrum. And then, uh, last thing I want to address something from. Uh, 
uh, in Helen's paper, uh, she said that uh, unlicensed has a little bit of a branding problem. Uh, I think that there's not enough push for it. So henceforth, I want to start calling it Freedom Spectrum. Just <laughs> <laughs> so. call it Free Spectrum. Freedom. Freedom Spectrum. Yeah, it's it's like Freedom Rock. Any questions? Yeah. Let me ask a quick question about the international and global uh, side of this issue. I know we have the work process with respect to strategic planning on that global scale. Any of you that have been involved in that process, would you say it's improved over the years? Has it become um, and adopted more strategic planning principles? I know Peter and I spoke a little bit about this before the conference. Uh, yeah, Michelle, I mean, what's interesting, I think, that is that other countries and regions of the world Spectrum communication policy generally, and spectrum policy, uh, have kind of become the laboratories that um, as lawyers would may call uh, Justice Brandeis mentioning in the case of uh, New St. Ives versus Lehman. Right, remember that? States are laboratories. It's not countries or regions. And so we see all these countries, especially in, in Europe, experimenting and competing with each other on, you know, basically progressive policy. And, and it, it was actually the UK with Professor Martin Cave on behalf of the Exchequer of the Exchange, the Treasury, who started a review in the UK, um, and it was an independent review, um, which I had a lot that inspired the Spectrum Policy Test. He followed up with that with an audit of the Ministry of Defense, use of Spectrum, um, and uh, other countries followed. Uh, just like the U.S. followed New Zealand in auctioning spectrum. So uh, it's important to keep an eye and learn from what those other, other countries are doing. Whether it has to be in the ITU is another matter. You know, uh, again, these happen on a more bilateral independent basis. And then maybe take the lessons learned from successes in those experiments, those laboratories, and take them to the ITU so that the developing countries of the world rely on the ITU can then pick up on this, uh, the benefits of, of uh, the lessons learned in this other country. I've got a good question. Yeah, I want to comment there is an interesting internal FCC budgeting issue of the International Bureau of Control of International Travel. If you want to go to a truly obscure ITUR meeting, you can probably get travel money to go to it. If you want to go to New Zealand or UK to see, to learn from their foreign policy lessons, almost never get travel money for that. There's a prioritization of travel money. So ITU is super, super priority for whatever few dollars they have for international travel, and any get smart travel, even to keep it at a few percent of the FCC budget, is almost impossible to get. So unfortunately, FCC is not learning as much. I agree fully about the laboratories in other countries, but it doesn't fit well into the FCC budgeting process. We have about three minutes left, so I'll ask all the panelists to give me their thoughts about any future predictions or the next big spectrum debate that you see forthcoming. Let's start on the other end with Ellen, if you've got any thoughts along those lines. Go out, out on a limb and say the incentive auctions are the next big spectrum. <laughs> That merger with Metro. <laughs> no, I, I actually think that uh, if if there was enough spectrum out there, I think and and uh, wireless networks are getting so good. I think as we get to LTE and advanced LTE and whatever comes next, that I really think and uh, mobile broadband is really going to come of age. And uh, I think as we move more into the tablet space. And, Laptops are already becoming obsolete. I think mobility is the scrap, and I do think and, uh, <coughs> we can just get our spectrum unleashed and, and get these networks built. I think that uh, they will uh, be the competition, I think, to the wireless <coughs> side. And the broadcast Chuck, you are the author of the Yes. Peter, any other thoughts on the next big spectrum? Today? Well, I want to build off of your comment about the the disparate roles of NTA and FCC. I've only been at NTA a few months, so I don't have a grasp of everything, but I do predict that the um, the two roles, you know, are very complementary, and I think the two communities, you know, being the 
federal, non-federal, um, are, are, right, are right now engaged in some discussions uh, about you know, sharing access to you know, some of the bands like 1755, 18, uh, I always forget that one, uh, and 1850. But, but this is not, you know, I mean, this collaboration has been going on for a while. I mean, one of the initial things that the FCC did uh, right after the Spectrum Policy Task Force was revise uh, like a 60-year-old memorandum of understanding with the Department of Commerce and NTIA to, you know, basically put in place a very a good, you know, working relationship. We uh, did the ultra-wideband rules in collaboration with 3G. Uh, 70, 80, 90 gigahertz, which Mike was involved in. So, I mean, I think that, and then I think the benefit, my prediction would be the benefits of this kind of cross pollinization that's going on at the industry level, at the federal level, that's going on in these working groups under the Commerce Director Management Advisory Committee are going to really going to be positive in the long term uh, benefits where you know, the federal side gets to start benefiting a lot of the innovation on the non-federal side and, and actually vice versa. There's a lot of innovation going on in the, on the non-federal side. Thanks. Thanks, David. Mike? Two quick things. One is, notwithstanding Peter's view with the uptake, everything in ATI works very well. I would urge you to read Section 5 of the PCAST report, which makes some incremental. Everyone's so upset about PCAST because of the cellular industry's part about other part of it. Nobody's read Section 5. Read Section 5. There are major issues in NCIA that need change. Section 5 was a good incremental approach. I, uh, given the election, I think there's a good chance those will be implemented. And the other thing I urge you to read is Commissioner Pye's very first speech at Carnegie Mellon a few months ago. We recall Section 7, the Stepchild of the Communications Act. If we're to get innovative technology, we have to do something about Section 7. I think it's, it's the, the text that was adopted in the early 80s is irrational. We either have to repeal it or we have to come up with a framework that works. Could you remind everybody? Section, <laughs> seven, section 7 says it's the policy of the United States to be in favor of new technology. I don't think that's a bad idea. But then it goes on to make some statements like things ought to be approved in one year. One year is irrational. And what's supposed to be done in one year is, is but Section 7 reform is desperately needed. Commissioner <coughs> Pye uh, chose that as a subject for his very first public address, and uh, I, I hope that that will be an important issue uh, in the next year to stimulate R&D and innovative technology so that the characters can use it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks to all the panelists.